Welcome back to the Elsewhere podcast. And today's guest is Nicola Conlon. Nicola has a fabulous supplement company called Nochido. And we're going to get right into what that is, what it does, and why you need it. So hi, Nicola. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here in person. I know. I'm really excited to have you. Somebody I love to follow on Instagram. So Nicola is very good value, by the way. So we'll give her Instagram handle out at the end. But um, she's really good value to follow. You're one of my favorite ones. I always watch all of your stories because I know it's not going to be nonsensical. It's good. Um, Right. So before we get into your supplement, tell me a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. So I think probably a disclosure, I'm a total science geek. Um, Love that. That that is me. Um, So I'm a scientist uh, and I specialize in longevity. Um, But my background, you know, I never never knew, really knew I wanted to be a scientist, I guess. My background was that I was just always super interested in the body and how it works. I just think it's amazing the fact we're alive and everything that is going on inside of ourselves to just to keep us ticking, essentially. Um, so that's sort of led me down this path of, you know, going to uni, studying biology. Then I went on and did a PhD. Then I got very frustrated in academia because there's a lot of cool science happening, but scientists can sort of keep things in labs. They don't like mm. to share the research. So I thought, well, how can I, you know, get people to understand some of this cool science. So back then, very naively, I thought, well, I'll go into drug development because, you know, drugs help people. Mm. Um, And if we can develop new drugs, it might help people. So I went and worked in drug development, um, originally working in cancer therapy. Um, And then one day my boss sort of came to me and said, oh, Nicola, we're going to move you off cancer and we're going to put you on a project looking at aging. And at the time I was like, what? Like a drug for aging? Mm. Like this doesn't make sense. How long ago was this? Oh, this would have been in like uh, about 2014. So like a okay. ten, year, 10 years ago. Mm. So this was before longevity became a the, cool yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, this is back in the day when even scientists kind of spoke about it. Hush, hush. Yeah, there was know. no human podcast. There was no David Sinclair. No, that, you know I, I mean, mean, there was. But, yeah, but, they, they but they weren't on podcasts or Rogan, were they? Yeah, exactly that. So this was when the research was starting to come out because... In drug development, you know, we're we're developing drugs against all sorts of different diseases. But actually what scientists began to say was our main risk factor for pretty much every disease that we are suffering from or trying to treat is our age. Mm. Like out of everything we can do that is bad for us, getting older is the worst thing for your health. So within the sort of longevity research community, everyone was like, are we completely approaching this the wrong way? Because if things like cancer, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, if their biggest risk factor is age and age is the root cause, then aren't these all symptoms of aging, in which case aging would be the disease. So why don't we try and treat the disease that is aging? So again, back then, even as a scientist, if you stood up at a conference and said, I'm treating aging as a disease. As a disease, it would be like, oh my goodness, you're crazy. Um, Let alone speaking about it to the public. But slowly, the research that has come out has now unequivocally demonstrated that actually you can target aging at its root cause. And it does have an impact on all of the different age-related diseases. So this is why we're now suddenly hearing a lot more about longevity even just, you know, in the general public and amongst friends. Um, Certainly, if I'd have spoke to my friends 10 years ago about what I was doing, they all just were like, Nicola, you're nuts. You know, have fun. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I completely agree. And the image that was coming up in my mind is um, from David Sinclair's lab, but Mm. they reversed the aging in some mice. Mm. And they had a mouse that was like, had gray hair on it, looking a bit old. and, And then they had one with lovely, shiny brown hair. And these were the same. These were sisters or something these were the same age but yeah. yet one had it kind of age reversed or it just hadn't rapidly aged like the other one yeah and it was incredible so they've done it both ways mm. they've done it where they've reversed aging and mm. also like prevented aging and I think a lot of people when you start talking about this automatically assume oh this is about living longer and about you know extending lifespan and it can get a bit of a bad press 
because people are like, well, why, why would I want to live longer? Like this is all crazy stuff. But actually it's not about lifespan. It's about your health span. Yeah. It's about the lifespans that we now have, which are long thanks to improvements in sanitation and, you know, uh, modern medicine and things like this, but we're not living them all in good health. You know, for a woman, uh, a health span, so the proportion of our lifespan that will actually live in good health is only estimated to be up to 64 years, mm. but our lifespan's 83. So this is like nearly a 20 year gap where we're living in poor health. So a big focus of longevity science is how do we improve our health span so that we can live our, lo our long lifespans, but in good health without age related conditions and frailty and disease and all of the other, you know, negative things that come with aging. So in, I mean, in a scientific term, what is aging? So really, it's just the decline in the ability of our bodies to repair and regenerate. And I always get people uh, to sort of think of it this way. Our body has everything in it that we need to be young and healthy. Just look at a child or even a teenager. Mm. They do not need any help with aging, <laughs> you know. Everything in their bodies is making sure their skin's great. They recover easily. They repair easily. It's all inside of our bodies, the ability to do this. But as we get older, this ability to repair and regenerate just gets turned down. And when I say turned down, that's the key bit. It doesn't get lost. So all the research that we're now doing is looking at how can we switch it back on? How can we reactivate this innate capacity that we actually do have to stay young? that just gets turned down. What age does it stop kind of like growing, 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 developing, 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 and then uh oh, stop. Now we're on that decline. Because, or yeah. is it like different systems do it at different levels? Yeah. Because I always hear like, oh, your collagen stops after 25, starts declining after 25. Then you've got, obviously, obviously it, your height, you keep growing and growing and growing until about 18. So obviously mm -hmm. things are still developing until you're about 18. And then what, when we get into our early 20s, is it then, are we on a decline? So like different organ systems and different parts of the body decline at different rates. Some are faster than others. But I think in terms of the, the accepted theory is that it's kind of when we reach the end of childbearing age. And one way to sort of understand why we age is to look at it through the eyes of evolution. Mm -hmm. So everything in our body and in our biology is being designed through uh, the process of evolution. So evolution is only ever going to keep things in our body that are good at making us survive to pass on our genes to the next generation. So if you look at like, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, it was very uncommon for people to live into the 80s. Mm. You know, you'd get to 40 or 50s and that was average life expectancy. And then you would probably die from a tooth abscess or in childbirth or, you know, an infectious disease or something like that. So everything in our bodies has evolved to kind of make us be good at being young and getting to the point of passing on our genes and fulfilling our purpose. Mm. But so you hit to like menopause. Yeah. And then yeah. And then we didn't should, used to live. Should, should be death. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. yeah. As far as evolution, yeah, yeah. Very, you put it very crudely. Yeah. yeah. As far as evolution's concerned, it's like, right, your body should have done its job now. Don't need to look after it. And it's, there's actually a name for this. It's called this is disposable soma theory. And it's literally a theory that your body is like a disposable shell for your DNA. <laughs> um, and once you've done your job, the, the shell doesn't matter anymore. I know. And this is why we see after childbearing age, our body's like, okay, should have done its job. Why would we bother investing all this energy and time and repair when we have fulfilled our purpose? So you see all these, these functions starting to get turned well, down. Well, exactly. That's why libido goes down. Because multiple you, things you just yeah. don't you just don't need it because sex is all about procreation yeah this is why men unfortunately ladies whatever you're hardwired into finding younger women attractive who are of fertile age yeah and like it, that's just reality it's just evolution it is evolution. people are arguing about yeah. this you know but, and this is it anything to do with biology can be explained mm. when you look at it through the eyes of evolution because most things in biology kind of don't make sense like if you look at them with the modern lives that we're living today, but when you look back through how we're, our bodies are designed to live where, you know, we're basically cavemen and women, <laughs> you yeah. know, evolution is is very slow. Our, our evolution hasn't caught up and our bodies haven't caught up to with the lives that we're living today. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So 
we know this. We're looking at everything through the eyes of evolution and we know we're kind of hitting 40s, 50s and everything's on the downturn. But unfortunately, you know, maybe our generation are going to be living to 100, especially if we've got anything to do with it. I know I'll be living <laughs> to 100, but I want to be living it, you know, with fantastic knee health yeah. and, you know, a uh, great posture and muscle tone and still being able to open jars and things yeah. like that. And I want to look great, you know, and I want my cells to be great. So what can we do? to kind of help our bodies because we're going to be living way past, you know, our, our menopausal ages and we want the best quality of life. Mm. So what what can we do? Well, everything you've just described there is the definition of health span, mm. which is exactly what we want. We want to be living healthy, fulfilled lives where we can live exactly how we want to live. And a key way to do this is to look at cellular health. So if you think of everything in the body, everything you know, what, what we're experiencing, the way we're feeling, the the way we're moving, our skin, the exterior, it all starts inside at the cellular level. So everything to do with aging, what we now know is driven by sort of failures at the cellular level. And in the longevity space, these things are known as the hallmarks of aging. So they are 12 key things that seem to fail in our cells that drive the entire aging process. So a lot of things that we can do are looking at how we can target these hallmarks of aging to switch back on cellular health and that which will then promote the health of our entire bodies because we've got 37 trillion cells in our bodies. So if the cells aren't working very well, then you haven't got much luck for the rest of you working very well. And, you know, when you start talking about cellular health and things like that, a lot of people will say, well, oh, do you know what? It's my genetics, you know, mm. um, oh, I, I'm not going to age well because of my genes or my mom had this or, you know, whatever. Well, actually, it's only around 20 percent of how well you will age that is influenced by your genes. The other 80 percent is actually your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So this is the, you know, quite frankly, the boring stuff <laughs> that we've heard time and time again, but it actually works. So things like your diet, your exercise, your social connection, your mental well-being, you know, all things like that actually play the greatest role in how well you will age. I couldn't agree more. Mm. And honestly, the more I learn about this, and I listen to so many podcasts on 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 this all the time from loads of different people, and the more I know about my body, well, the more I think, God, I don't know anything. <laughs> and the second thing I think is, like sometimes you can know too much because it has a huge effect on my lifestyle. Yeah. Which is, well, some people would say, well, that's a really great thing. But like, I'm looking at what Grace is eating in nursery and, you know, it's like croissants, cereal, you know, crap all the time. Well, you know, what I would deem as crap. And I'm like, oh my God, she's a little girl and she's starting her day with all this sugary, carby nonsense, which is just awful. And uh, it, re it, it really gets to me and I think oh god I'm gonna have to complain whatever but then going through my everyday life it's like I'm a bit of a killjoy as well because I'm like well I don't want to go there for dinner mm. and I don't want to eat that and I'm not eating that fast food and no I don't want to drink alcohol because I'm thinking <laughs> about my cellular aging yeah or just in generally my inflammation levels mm. or everything especially because I'm now hitting I'm, a, I'm just under 40 I'm 39 and uh and I, everybody I speak to, I've even given up caffeine. Mm. And everybody I speak to saying it's going to start getting hard now. You know, we have experts here all the time. When you hit that peri to menopause age now, everything's really going to start getting harder. And you will see the difference of the people who really took care of yeah. themselves and the ones who did not. Mm -hmm. it, the gap is going to widen, I think, at 40. So I think about these things all the time. So you're dead right. It is the boring stuff. It is diet you know, lifestyle. And we can talk about, you know, what is the best diet and what we do know is probably whole food, eat yeah. like mother nature. Yeah. I think when it comes to aging, diet's so important. So there's been studies recently looking at your biological age. Mm -hmm. So this is the rate at which you are aging on the inside. So most people don't realize they've got two ages. You've got your chronological age. How many times you've been around the sun. Yeah. yeah. You birth certificate age, yeah. basically. Nothing you can do about that. Just lie about it. Can't change it. But your biological age is the rate you are aging on the inside. And actually, biological age is something you can do something about. Because what's been found is often a person's biological age and chronological age don't like match up. So for example, someone could be, you know, you said 
39 and I could measure your biological age and hopefully you'd be more like 29. Yeah, yeah. But equally, it could be like more like 59. 49 or 59. Yeah. And, I, you know, we see this. Yeah. And that shows that you are aging much faster than you should be. And your biological age is a much better predictor of your future health than your chronological age. So we already know aging is your biggest risk factor. This is even more accurate at predicting how healthy you're going to be in the future. And I think the fact that we can now measure this, it proves, I guess, two, two really important things. The first thing it proves is that a lot of people said for a long time, well, you know, even if you, you're telling us that you're going to slow aging, how are we ever going to prove it? Like you can't do a clinical trial where you look and wait and see how long it takes someone to die. <laughs> you know, it's not practical. But now we can measure biological age with like a simple finger prick blood test. This is something we can actually measure and show people how well they're aging. And believe me, there is nothing more incentivizing to changing your diet or something like that when your biological age comes back 20 years older than it actually is. But secondly, the fact that we see this discrepancy, this um, this difference between a person's biological and chronological age, it is sort of, you know, put a nail in the coffin of one of the main reasons why people thought you couldn't, like longevity wasn't a real thing, like, or, or promoting longevity wasn't a real thing. Because a lot of people always said, well, aging is fixed. It's programmed. It's like, you know, once it's, once you're born, the clock mm. starts, it's ticking and you can do nothing to stop the march of time. It's this natural thing. Don't interfere with it. It is what it is. But if it was programmed, that would mean our chronological age and our biological age should always be identical, but they're not. And that showed us that there's something going on in our cells to either speed up the aging process or slow down the aging process. And if we know that you can adjust it and we can find out what you can adjust in the cells, then we know we can actually impact it and do something about it. And that's where things like diet come in. So diet actually changes what we call the expression of genes in our cells. So it literally switches on and off how your different genes, which affect how your cells and ultimately how your body function. And the best diet, kind of for biological aging, shall we say at the minute, is considered to be something that contains a really high proportion of lots of different plants. So this doesn't mean you have to become vegan, you can still have meat, but if you can eat around 30 different plant materials every week, and I say plant materials because not it's not just fruit and veg. This is like nuts and seeds and, you know, basically anything, herbs, spices, anything mm. that's coming from a plant that has been shown to lower biological age, not only because these things tend to be less inflammatory than the kind of modern diet as you've just described that you know or the, the beige diet yeah. that people are eating um but also because plants contain so many natural polyphenols antioxidants so many powerful chemicals that actually you know positively impact our health you're absolutely right like I couldn't I've said it better myself. Um, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's so hard. And I, I am conscious of this 30 plants thing all yeah. the time. Tim Spector talks about it. And I always think, Christ, you know, and I try and do, I do loads of curries and I try and put loads of veg in yeah. it and stuff like that. And this is my other gripe of, you know, when people are just, does my head in about calories because, um, okay, let's say fitness inspo influencer. Mm. And they're like, see, you can still have donuts on this diet. You can still have this on this mm. diet. I'm like, yeah, you might be mm. able to because like, yes, you expended the same energy. If you had 200 grams, 200 calories of a carrot and 200 calories of a donut, it would cost you the same energy to burn off. Do you think that's having the same effect on the bioterrain of your body and yeah. your cellular health? No, it is not. And that's my other thing that my friends can't seem to understand yeah. when they're like, oh, well, I can just have this Mackey's because I'm still under my calories for today. And I'm like, I, yeah. I, I can't, I'm like to the point where I can't be asked to discuss it with them anymore. I'm like, yeah, you crack on. Completely agree. And it's like, you know, some of my friends, I get so frustrated when I see them putting these like the, the you know, zero calorie yeah. sauce and sweet there and this. And I'm like, oh God, just, just have, have some fruit, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just have some fruit. You're going to get so much more out of it than trying to, you know, have these fake, fake things, fake ingredients, mm. um, fake calories that just are shakes, not beneficial. Fuel shakes, yeah. things like that. I'm just so dead against these things. Yeah. Um, okay. So obviously diet is one of them. Mm. Um, what else could we be doing 
um, to reverse our biological age or at least obviously not progress the aging? Yeah, I think anything, I always say anything that actually puts your body under a little bit of stress, which sounds counterintuitive because you always think, oh, stress is a bad thing. Mm. But actually stress in very low doses is actually very good for your body. So again, going back to evolution, when we were cavemen and women running around and we had to, you know, find our food and, um, you know, weren't eaten constantly, we have pathways in our body that helps us to survive that period of stress. So anything that puts our body under a state of energy stress, so if we are exercising hard or we are fasting, our body and our cells are suddenly like, oh, we don't have any energy coming in. So we need to stop being wasteful and actually we need to switch on repair and we need to switch on natural energy production. So when you see these types of sort of, you know, natural stress, shall we say, kick in, it actually switches on a lot of cellular repair in your body. These pathways that are sitting there in our bodies waiting to work, but because of our modern lifestyle, where we're sitting on a bum all day and eating the McDonald's and drinking yeah. shakes and being told we must eat our breakfast and we must have snacks and you know we must constantly be eating, our cells never get a chance to switch on these pathways that are sitting there ready to help us. So actually putting your body under a little bit of stress by doing some high intensity interval training or doing a bit of intermittent fasting actually do have a huge benefit on, on cellular health. So uh, with the fasting thing, which mm. is so interesting, we could probably talk about, you know, that for an hour. Mm. But um, it's, I would imagine you do a bit of fasting yourself. Mm. What would be, for women, let's say, who mostly listen to this podcast, what would be kind of like the best way to start doing a bit of fasting then? Yeah, so fasting, usually when people hear the word fasting, they're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be so hard and I don't want to starve and this is bad for you. But actually, when we talk about fasting, especially for women, it, the period of time you need to fast for is not actually that long. So it's estimated between 12 and 14 hours with no food. So mm -hmm. I, this would be like water. So a lot, some people go, oh, you can have the, you can have drinks and things. I would say water it's only if you want to do it properly. And no supplements. Any Anything that your body thinks is a nutrient, you shouldn't have during that period. So 12 to 14 hours, uh, 14 ideally. And this can be done, you know, by just having your last meal earlier and having your breakfast later. Yeah, it's, it's not really, crazy. You know, so you could be like seven o'clock, yeah. your last meal, yeah. and then you could eat at like, what, nine, ten o'clock in yeah, the morning? exactly. So it's not, whilst people think this is something that's going to be difficult and, you know, just the word fasting has negative connotations with it, it's not actually that difficult to implement. Uh, there's some studies that show in that post-menopause maybe you need to go up a little bit longer maybe it's around 16 hours but generally for women it's between 12 to 14 and that is enough time to kick start that basically what it does is it sets off like an energy alarm bell in your cell and when that energy alarm bell is activated that's when it switches on all these downstream pathways that start repairing your cells it starts recycling any damaged junk that's built up in your cells and you know it literally is like a it like a cleanup system and your body gets switched on when you do this fasting is it better if you go longer like i've done quite a few 36 hour fasts yeah so there's a lot of research to show like different levels of fasting can induce different levels of benefits to the body so longer fasts do have a more intense effect on the cells um, and the patterns of genes and all the pathways that are switched on but it seems like you don't need to do that that often mm. um you know once every couple of months do a more intense fast but that's something that people should definitely build their way up yeah. to oh and yeah, yeah don't you'll, do it overnight you know what and what's really surprising is actually once you get used to fasting how easy it is yeah to go without because again because we are in a society where we're told to eat constantly our glucose levels in our blood are on a roller coaster um and this is an, another thing i always say to people you know, maybe try a continuous glucose monitor. You'll have seen people that like walk around with a little yeah. white patch on their arm, uh, usually for diabetics, but just wearing one of them once in your life will seriously open your eyes up to what happens in your body every time you eat. 
And it means that we, our bodies are so used to having this glucose roller coaster, this sugar crash and high and crash and high, that all of a sudden when we do try to fast, it's really difficult. We mm. get headaches, we're like hungry, you know, we feel horrific, horrific. And that's because our bodies are not what we call metabolically flexible. Like they literally can't deal with not having the sugar. But once you get used to fasting and just build it up, you soon realize that, oh, actually, I don't even feel hungry. I don't have a headache. Um, this is actually pretty easy once you get used to it. Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, yeah, 36, I think, is the my longest mm. ever. Well, apart from when I was on that desert island where that was forced on me and I had, couldn't do anything about it. There was <laughs> no opportunity to eat anything. So that was probably my There longest. was a lot to battle with. Yeah. That was like what evolution designed you for, though. Correct. You know what? Yeah, I hunt said, for your food. Yeah, and yeah. that. <laughs> experience has changed my life in so many ways mm -hmm. and I feel like you know like honestly they should redo the show but call it Ozempic Island because if you want to lose some <laughs> frigging weight you go there but you're going to do it now a guy lost four stone in front of my eyes in, in five weeks yeah four stone in five weeks and he didn't do it with no bullshit mm -hmm. with no jabs where you've got to actually turn it off right yeah he was just literally and he had more energy reserves obviously so he had mm -hmm. more energy than the rest of us but he um, he was just inc incredible. He was just powering through all the time and everything normalized. His blood pressure went down. Yeah. You know, his cholesterol went down. Everything, everything that they tested us on just went down and he really kept it up when we left as yeah. well. Um, and this I, is it. Your body is amazing. Well, this is the thing. And then we, it wasn't like I was doing weights or anything like that, like I would in the gym. I was just naturally going through... Mm, the jungle. So mm -hmm. I was bending, squatting, mm -hmm. lifting. These are all, these are just lifestyle things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's how my body was designed. And I lived how my body was designed. You would catch a fish, you might eat it, you'd eat a coconut. That, you know, you didn't have any processes. You just had to cook stuff on a fire. There was no salt, sugars, preservatives, sauces. There was nothing that I always bring myself back to baseline if I ever feel I could go off on a tangent on crazy diets or whatever. I just think that you know yeah. how to live, you've done it. Oh, I'd be happy to go off on yeah. a desert island together. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Back to basics, the only, reset. <laughs> the only thing that was bad about it was the sun damage. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. We had a bit of sun cream, but it was crap. Yeah, and you just, massive hat. <laughs> yeah, you just can't do anything about that apart from yeah. sitting. The, and it was so hot, you had to sit in the shade all day. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I, I, we were just talking about this before the pod, but longevity mm. seems to be kind of great if you are mega rich. You know, we, I, I saw you at a conference last week in mm. London and I'm looking at all these amazing stands and this is like mm. the aesthetics industry, right? So obviously you can inject yourself with all different manner of things. There's hyperbaric chambers, there's red light therapy. There is, there's lots of different things that will help your cells regenerate, but they are, there's a big barrier to entry. Even I, with who spends a lot of money on health and wellness. In fact, that's the only place I spend it. I don't go out. <laughs> I don't really buy myself any like crazy handbags or anything. My whole life is designed yeah. to reduce in cellular aging. <laughs> yeah. Same. And um and and even I think, fucking hell, it's expensive. Yeah. It's another wage, realistically, if you want to try and maintain, you know, your health. So um do you think it hopefully the more mainstream it becomes? It will start coming down in price. Yeah. But at the moment, um, what would you say is the biggest bang for your book? Obviously, we've spoke about lifestyle. Mm. We've spoke about diet. Weight training is something that I say every time yeah, on this pod. That is, that is so important. So again, your muscle mass is, is correlated with age-related disease, with biological age. Muscle is so important. And this is something as women that we absolutely need to get our heads around because, again, you know, we were talking about things that frustrate us. The frustration with friends who are like weighing themselves and going, oh, I put on weight. And it's like, oh, my goodness. And then you look and they've lost their muscle mass. Mm. And then they got, you're like, no, you need to go to the gym. And then they start doing some weights and then they put on weight and they're like, no, this is bad. And you're like, it's good. Muscle weight is good. Mm. You've got to maintain your muscle as you age, especially perimenopausal, menopausal women. It is so important. So, yeah, strength training, resistance training. And that's is, you, if you buy yourself a set of weights, pretty heavy weights, that's yeah. then virtually free. Yeah. And cost per use, it's like, 
it's so important. And I always say that, like, yeah, of course, there's all these crazy things out there that are going to cost hundreds of pounds. But one of the biggest things you could do is just weight training. Yeah, even body weight. Yeah. You know, the amount of people that can't do a, like a plank. Or a press up. Or, a, you know, something of their own mm. body weight is just actually quite alarming. So even body weight exercises are, are, are really good. But I think in, in terms of your, your comment about longevity being something that's, it's elitist. Mm. And this is something that's massively bothers me because being in this space for a decade, I've, I've watched it go from, you know, something that was amongst scientists to then, oh, it's suddenly tech billionaires and, uh, you know, biohacking men and people that have a lot of money, then mm. aesthetics and people that are opening super expensive clinics where you've got to go and live there for two weeks and get every single yeah. thing analyzed. And, you know, this is the only way that you can possibly get into longevity. And for me, that is something that is, is not what I stand for. And my real passion and the reason that I do what I do is to democratize science because longevity and the science behind longevity is something that can benefit every single person on this planet because we are all aging and everyone should have access to this. Now, as I mentioned, my, my job is in drug development. Um, you know, I believed <laughs> that going into drug development would help people, but I soon became very aware that well, two things. If we wait for drug development, it's going to take 20 years before any of this science is actually out and available to people. And then there's a barrier to entry because it's a drug and drugs are expensive. But also what I noticed was that a lot of molecules that we were studying that worked really, really well in the body actually were not drugs. Um, so we couldn't patent them. Part of my job was literally to look through lists of molecules and see what we could patent and own. And if we couldn't patent and own them, they literally go in the bin. Mm. So I'd be going through these lists being like, oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. All natural molecules, all well-known, all things that could be put, you know, people could be using now, but the companies don't want to put any research into them because they can't own them and they can't make money off them. So we would then go and invest like 50 million into something that worked half as well. We'd never heard of it before, didn't know if it was safe and was going to take ages to get to market. So I was like, commercially, yeah, I understand why you're doing it. Mm. But ethically, this is crazy because there are things that are cheap and available that people could be benefiting from now. So I actually walked away from the drugs industry. I left my job um, and I said, I'm going to start a supplement company, a company that is looking at these natural molecules, these molecules that we can actually get into the hands of people like my mom and dad mm. who don't have loads of money, yeah. but could really benefit from something like this, but give them the science and the research that they deserve. Because, you know, everyone said, Nicola, what are you doing? You are leaving your very credible job in drug development that you spent 10 years at university to get and you're going to start a supplement company and supplements don't work and they well, are this snake is, oil. This and, is totally oh. the argument because big pharma don't want supplements to no. work because they just want to sell the drugs. Yep. So, and then you've got the, the FDA who won't even like, like they won't look at things They and it's too mm. expensive to do clinical trials yeah. in any real way. And honestly, there's a big issue there for me and I think if you were a doctor you know I think you should have a an eye on all of it yeah you know what I mean if you're yeah. a GP absolutely drugs have got their place but absolutely supplements do as well yeah because it's all or nothing yeah. it's like oh no 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 you know as far as if you go and talk to your doctor about supplements they just very think, few yeah. will listen they'll just say oh we don't we don't follow no you need this you need the the, the diabetes drug or you need the statin exactly. or the you know just ignore and the rest of it. Then uh, I was reading a book on magnesium and how it's like miracle magnesium. It was a wonderful book, actually. And one of the things she said was when they were testing loads of things for magnesium, uh, there was loads of clinical trials and loads of doctors were doing them, but they only used one type of magnesium, which mm. was magnesium uh, oxide. So in 
everything <laughs> now when you go into and if you're ever getting prescribed magnesium or the yeah. recommended it's always magnesium oxide which is one of the worst ones yep. you could ever get because it's not bioavailable in the body so and that was because uh, one woman who was manufacturing magnesium oxide gave it to them all when they were doing the clinical trials. Mm. So it's not that that's the best one. It's just no. that's the only one they tested. And again, so clinical trials and data can be skewed as well. Um, but no, I'm absolutely with you on the supplement. So tell me about Nachido, your supplement. So one of the things that always, you know, really struck me was a molecule called NAD within the longevity space. And this is something that's basically found in every cell in the body. It's very important for energy production in our cells and also for repair. So as a general rule of thumb, if you've got high levels of NAD in your cells, you will have lots of energy production and lots of repair and your cells will be healthy. If you've got low NAD, then your cellular energy production goes down, your repair goes down and your cellular health goes down. Now, one of the huge sort of breakthroughs within the longevity space was the fact that this NAD molecule declines in our body as we get older. So a lot of scientists said, okay, so if we've got this important molecule for protecting our cellular health and protecting us against some of the age-related issues in our cells and it declines with age, why don't we just not let it decline with age? Can we top it back up or can we just stop it from declining so rapidly? So there was a huge amount of research looking at whether this was possible. And first of all, it was found that NAD is something that you can increase in your cells. But more importantly, when you do increase NAD, you get the results that you spoke about earlier, where you have the two mice mm. <laughs> and one is like really old and one is really young because it's had its NAD kept high. So this created a massive buzz within the scientific community. And a lot of people then started saying, well, you know, can we boost NAD? How do we do it? And it was realized that you can increase cellular NAD using things like supplements. So this has meant that, you know, this is a way that we can take something that doesn't have to be a drug and make it accessible to consumers that can actually benefit from the research, which basically shows that NAD can really protect cellular health. So as your NAD levels decline, which is which is quite a rapid decline actually it's estimated your NAD halves every 20 years so that's even mm. from birth wow yeah okay so you, you need, need a lot a, of it you need a lot of it so and, if I wanted to be like living like I'm 18 yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, top it up a bit <laughs> so okay I know the supplement industry is the wild west yeah not all supplements are made the same. Mm. And that's the big issue here because I know I'm in a couple, maybe 12 months from now, I'm going to walk into Home Bargain and it'll say NAD. Oh, absolutely. It probably already does. Yeah. And <laughs> everyone will be thinking, oh, there's that NAD <laughs> yeah. I was listening to that's going to reverse my cellular health. I can yeah. guarantee it's probably not in that version. No. So this is, and I say, I speak about this all the time. Mm. I'm like, 95% of the supplements don't work. I'll yeah. sit there and say that myself. So um, how do we know which one we're going to get? Let's say, okay, I'm in. I want to get some NAD, which yeah. we, like, you know. Okay. Why is yours so fantastic? Let's have a little science yeah. lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies for interrupting this podcast, but I need to ask a favor. If you're enjoying this podcast so far, then please hit that subscribe button right now. I'll be straight up and honest that I want to see this podcast grow and flourish into something that I'm really proud of. And the only way that I can do that is with your help. So if you've ever learned anything useful from these conversations, then please return the favor by liking, rating, subscribing, and maybe even sharing it with your friends. Thanks very much. Let's get back to the episode. So when, when NAD was found as this thing you wanted to boost, the first thing people said was, great, let's just put some NAD powder in a capsule and swallow it. That's what you'd find in home bargains, by yeah. the way, in yeah. the future. Um, you find Maybe it, mixed with a lot of rice, rice flour or something some chalk. like that. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of that on Amazon at the moment. Now, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that because NAD is a really unstable molecule, which means you can't take it orally. So you can't put it in a capsule and swallow it because it just gets degraded in the gut. So this is when you'll have probably started to see people um, talking about NAD injections mm -hmm. or NAD IV infusions. And the idea here is that let's bypass the gut and just, yeah. you know, inject it straight into the blood or infuse it straight into the blood. With the idea being that, well, you just, you know, it's not degraded, it's in the body, job done. Now, these things cost a lot of money. You know, yeah. you're looking at hundreds of pounds for the injections yeah. or the infusions. Every month. 
And in fact, it, I'm just going to do a little cost analysis. Sorry, if I'm getting my phone out. I just wanted to see what it actually was because I know there is one product on the market that's three fifty. So we've got twelve. That's four thousand two hundred a month. Uh, sorry, a year per annum. Yeah, which is so, so inaccessible. So to earn that, so you know, pre tax, right? Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, you're in for a lot. Yeah, that's it's a significant it's, amount of your revenue. It's not accessible, but. Also, the more alarming thing to me as a scientist is actually there is very little data to support that it actually works right. and also its safety. So when you look at NAD, not only is it an unstable molecule, but it's also a really big molecule. So yes, these things are getting the NAD into the blood, but NAD doesn't do anything in the blood. It actually needs to be inside of our cells because this is where all the pathways are that it interacts with. This is where our mitochondria are, which produce our energy. It's where our DNA are, which NAD repairs. So NAD actually has to get into the cells. And because it's a large molecule, cells don't just let anything in or out. They're like a little fortress. To get a big molecule in, you have to have special channels. And most of our cells do not have those channels. So what it seems is that the NAD, yeah, you're paying a lot of money to get it in the blood, but it doesn't actually go into the cells. So you're essentially paying like four grand a year and what you're just excreting it. Yeah. So if you ever speak to anyone who's had an IV mm. infusion of NAD, they will tell you how awful it is. They will say, Painful. we feel sick. We feel like we've got heart palpitations, like our head's going to explode. You have to infuse it like really slowly over, you know, about four hours at least um, to try and get rid of some of these side effects. And the reason being is you're putting a huge amount of something into the blood that is not meant to be in the blood. Mm. And to date, there's only one clinical trial which actually shows it's all degraded and it doesn't get into the cells. And I know there's one about to be published that even worse shows that this huge amount of NAD in the blood triggers an inflammatory response, mm. which explains why people feel horrendous while they're having it. So I think we're going to start to see these things kind of go down in popularity as more people understand that it's not actually a good thing to do. Um, if something's declined in the body like NAD, the best thing to do is try to switch back on your natural production or to, you know, fix the reason why it's declined in the first place. And we've mentioned David Sinclair a few times. Yeah. He probably is the person that made NAD famous. Yeah. I remember um, <laughs> I remember literally everyone that went fucking nuts as soon as he was on Rogan. Yeah. And he's talking about NAD and NMN. NMN, yeah. So NMN, if you've heard of NAD, you've definitely heard of NMN. So NMN is basically a supplement. Mm -hmm. It's a precursor to NAD. So what I mean by a precursor is it's like one of the sort of raw materials that your body uses to make NAD. So the idea behind taking NMN is that if your NAD has gone low, if you give your body more of the raw, raw material that it needs to make more NAD, hopefully it'll turn into NAD. And for a long time, it was thought that taking NMN was the best way to boost NAD until research came out recently that demonstrated that the, the enzyme in your cell that literally takes the raw material and turns it into NAD, that is what declines with age. Right. So you can give the body all the NMN you want, but if you don't have the, the enzyme or the pathway to actually convert it into NAD, then it's, it's pointless. I always say it's like if you have a NAD producing factory if your cell was like an NAD producing factory and you went into the factory and were like why is my NAD production gone down and you saw it was because the machines were broken the pipes were leaking there is no way you would just say oh let's just ignore all those problems let's order more raw material mm. and hope we get more NAD out at the end you'd be like no we need to fix the machines so now it's agreed within the scientific community that really, if you want to boost your NAD, you just need to fix that pathway. You need to switch back on your body's natural NAD production. So that is what we decided to do in Nichido. We were like, let's look at the latest science and let's actually design a supplement that's accessible for people, that's not crazy expensive, and get it out there which actually is proven to switch back on your body's natural production. So it fixes the root cause of the NAD decline. Wow. 
I've, I know everyone is going to be sold on this <laughs> <laughs> as soon as they listen to this. And I mean, it is a wonderful supplement. And the fact that, you know, you've, su- you've sat there and you've studied this a lot. Um, so, and I totally get it that I think the analogy with the factory is, yeah. is, is a great analogy because people, yeah. So we've got a lot of people just whacking themselves with NAD. You've also got a lot of people just drinking taking NMN, powdering it up. And I'm always like, no, that's just like one side of the fence. Mm. And people don't, they just hear something on a podcast and they think they can sort it out. Um, So much misinformation. mm. You know, the amount of times I hear people saying, oh, you can get it in your diet. And it's like, you can't. (laughs) You cannot get NAD in your diet. Your cells make all of the NAD that your body needs. Like you do not rely on it from your diet. Your cells literally make all of it. They make it, they recycle it, they make it, recycle it. And that is a pathway that gets turned down. So what we wanted to do was, again, harness your body's own natural production. Your body's very good at making it. It just gets turned down. So switch it back on. So we did a full human clinical trial to actually prove that it does this. Because as you mentioned, it's a lot of people will dismiss supplements because they're like, well, it doesn't work. So that's where I really wanted to be different. I was like, anything that we're going to bring to market is not only going to be accessible to people, but it's also going to have scientific studies, full double-blind placebo-controlled trials to prove that it actually does what we say it does. So it boosts NAD, it switches back on the pathway, it reduces inflammation, it lowers biological age. All of these things we demonstrated in a human clinical trial that's published for everyone to see. And have you had any pushback from anybody in the scientific community on that? I mean, you always get pushback Mm. in science. Science is notorious for, you know, if you go to a scientific conference, nobody stands up and cheers at the end when you present amazing data. Scientists naturally always try and pick apart things. But, but, you know, in terms of, um, I think we've we've largely had a, a positive response. Mm. Um, we got it published in an amazing journal. Um, it's a it's a Nature publication, which is anyone that knows science is like a gold standard journal. And the fact that this is a consumer product that's published in that type of scientific journal is is something that's unusual. Yeah, like normally it's a big deal. It it's, a, it's a big deal. Yeah. So you know, we're we're proud that. We've been able to do that and stand by our ethics um, and just get things out there that actually work. Um, And how has business been going? So when did you launch the business? So I founded the company back in 2017. Mm -hmm. We launched the product in 2019, actually in the US. Yeah. uh, Just because way more people were familiar with longevity and, you know, NAD and stuff like that in the US. Do a lot more over in the UK and now. But yeah, it's... For me, it's it's been oh, it's been a journey. You know, I was like, oh, I start a supplement company. Yeah. How hard can it be? It's tough. <laughs> tough out there, and especially because there's a lot of crap out there as well. Yeah, but especially in a space that's so new. You know, the longevity space is something that you know, until a couple of years, well, I'd say probably two years ago, nobody really spoke about longevity. Certainly, no one was speaking about NAD. And now we've seen this massive shift where you read all the trend reports for beauty and wellness mm-hmm. and NADs here, longevity's here, cellular health is here. So for me, that's super exciting because this is my passion. This is something I have studied for the last decade and, you know, got really sick of the fact that nobody wanted to hear, but now mm. everyone wants to hear. So I'm like, that's great. I'll talk about it. <laughs> and the thing is, you were ahead of the curve. Yeah. So now you've like, let's be honest, you've got 10 years ahead on anybody else. You yeah. know what I mean? You've been doing this and it's, listen, anything that you do, it takes time and practice yeah. and luckily you've probably made some mistakes while no one's really watching and yeah. now you're ready to go. Do you know what I mean? You've actually yeah. you set up a business, a D2C brand, and, and then you've launched it in America. And, and you know, you've, you've probably made those foundational steps yeah. when it wasn't cool or whatever. And those are the hardest years, by the way, as well. Yeah. And now I think you're, you're on the, you're just about to like hit like trajectory. Yeah. A million percent. And it's, it's, I love it. Do you know what? Yeah. It's tough. And it's, but I do, I do love it. My main passion is, is the education as well. Yeah. You know, the whole reason I started the company, as I said, was to democratize science. Like there's so much science that people could benefit from, but either they don't have access to it or they don't understand it. And there's nobody talking about it in a way that people can understand. So you can't benefit if you don't have the knowledge, knowledge is power. So 
it's just nice that I'm able to do something where not only is it a you know, a brand and a, a consumer product, but it's also just as much about the education and and teaching people that there is a, another way and there are things that they can do. You know, I'm the first person, as I'm sure you mm. are, that, you know, we have supplement companies, but we're the first people to say, sort your lifestyle out. Oh, a million percent, <laughs> yeah. Listen, otherwise it's just like, you know, torching yeah. your money. It's literally torching your it money. Is. And I always say to people like, if they tell me, oh, well, I have a terrible diet and I have this and that, I'm like, do you know what? Today is not the day for you. No, no magic no, pill. No point. Yeah. You might as well just literally use that money. And we're from, like, I'm in Liverpool, you're in the Northeast. These yeah. are two places in the country that are the most deprived. Yeah. And these are the places that really need this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I feel like, yeah, London is all about this longevity and everyone's lifestyle is a little bit better. But actually up here in the North is probably where we need it most and I like that the fact that you're making it accessible yeah and you know my sort of gauge has always been could my mom and dad afford yeah. this and you know I'm not from a wealthy background I'm from a working class family mm. and um you know I, I still I still think we've we've got some some room to grow and to improve it to still make things more accessible get costs down things like that but you know, this is really new science mm. and science is expensive. So naturally, the first sort of things that come out are always going to be not available to everyone because they are more expensive. But then as we start to see when people adopt things and they become more popular and the demand for things grows, then you can start to get the cost down. And I think this is where it's exciting now that we're seeing a lot more people take an interest in longevity, cellular health aging from within and and want products like this because this is when our time will come to be able to really then take the next step and and really do get this accessible to to way more people um because it is an elitist thing at the moment you know i think a lot of people will have heard of Brian Johnson, the, you know, the famous I bio. I love that guy. <laughs> You're like a super fan. I, I know. Like a super, if anybody doesn't know who Brian Johnson is, just spend like 20 minutes on YouTube watching <laughs> Brian Johnson because what a guy. And like I always say, I've said it on this podcast, I, mentally I'm, I'm right there with him. Mm. I just haven't got his resources or his time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But like, oh my God, if I had all the time in the world like he does and millions in the bank to be yeah. able to spend that kind of dough on myself, I'd be doing it too. He's an interesting character. Yeah. You know, he's spending like I don't know what the figure is it's like twenty thousand dollars a month like trying to stay young and does like all of the crazy what I'd say the crazy out there scientific experiments on himself mm. and you know all of the things he's doing although they seem completely bizarre so for example he like has a has blood transfusions from the blood taking the blood of his young son yeah, yeah. and putting it into himself now that may just be like people are going to be sitting there going what, what the, the hell fuck, yeah. like really like this is just ridiculous but actually there's a lot of science behind it a lot of good science mm. we know that young blood and old blood are very different so a, a sample of blood from an older person will be highly inflammatory it'll be pro-aging a young person, completely different. And if you take the blood from a young person and put it in an old person, it makes the old person younger. If you take an old person, I feel like blood, this, this is going to open up <laughs> ourselves up to like, you know, some horrible black market, awful things. This is it. And there was companies that have already been shut down in America that were doing this, this type of therapy. For like the, the ultra rich. Yeah, for the ultra rich. Like an Epstein Island just full of babies with yeah. like blood transfusions. <laughs> Come and get your young blood. Fuck. Um, yeah, not, not a good thought. But what we do know is the science is there. So I think in the near future, if we can work out which bits of the blood are good and which bits are bad, and then that could almost be replicated in a supplement or like a, an infusion or something. Mm. Um, you know, that is, that's where we're moving towards. But the longevity space, ugh, I mean, it, it is a crazy world. I'm not going to lie. Like the, the, the hardcore longevity enthusiasts, kind of the world that I am from, is not for the faint hearted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's very self-experimentation. 
um, a lot of crazy things, taking drugs that are not, you know, legal or or not approved for certain things. Um, and I always say, I feel like I sit in the middle of two worlds. I've got yeah. the crazy longevity world and I've got the average person and I'm like in the middle trying to go, right, what can we take out of this world and bring to the average person? Um, and how can we get the average person to understand a little bit of this world, but not think we're completely nuts? Um, I, well, I was just going to say, what's your friendship group like? Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that I have not got many friends, right? The thing yeah. like, there's probably less than one. Okay, I've yeah. probably got half a one I could probably talk to about this stuff. Yeah, you know, I have none of my friends are on that wavelength yeah. at all. It's very difficult, very isolating kind of world to be in, or the things that I that excite me. And I would imagine it's the same for you. But you you probably have got all those like scientisty, you know friends and I know you go to big conferences you went to that one in Honduras we should definitely mention that um <laughs> where you all meet up and probably geek out on all this stuff but yeah. you also are a mother yeah you know you, you have a job you're running a business you have a normal life as well and it must be very contrasting it is very contrasting but I actually think that's a good thing because I think a lot of people in the longevity space like the Brian Johnsons do not live in the real world yeah and I would say I'm a very down to earth, normal mm. person with a very, you know, um, average upbringing. Mm. And I kind of see what the real world is. And I'm sort of sitting there being like, how how do we fit these worlds together? Because I think I think that's going to be the big challenge. How, how do we take this normal world where we've been brought up in a very particular way to believe very particular things and the way we should be eating and sleeping and whatever and then throw in some complete opposite information um so uh, yeah a lot of my friends I, you know I don't talk to them very much about it because mm. they're not at that point where they're ready to talk about it because mm. they just their, their mindset is not there other groups of friends complete geek out all night about this sort of stuff um and which one do you gravitate towards more but do you know what both, both. yeah a bit of both I mean and I and I go to a lot of different events mm. so like as well like so talking about aging it it, it it impacts a lot of different areas. So I go to a lot of longevity events. I do a lot of biohacker events, which are more about like optimal living and wellness. Then like last week I saw you at an aesthetics mm. event, you know, very different group of people, very different focus, but all looking at the same thing, which is aging. So you see very different perspectives. So like one, one week I'll be having a conversation about people talking about Botox and filler and an aesthetics conference. The next week, I'm at a longevity conference and we're talking about how people are going to, you know, get their head chopped off and cryopreserved and, you know, <laughs> taken away and then brought back to life. Um, <laughs> and we laugh, but I genuinely and, think that's where And I'm laughing, is. but yeah. then they're like, oh yeah, my, here's my wristband that, you know, this is my life insurance policy. So if I drop down dead, these people will come and take my body and freeze me and then I will be you know, cryopreserved and brought back to life when I'm able to upload my brain to the cloud and, you know, download, live, it again. download my consciousness. And it's that's, mental, that is it? a very real conversation and, you know, something that, you know, is, is being researched. It's fucking mental. So yeah, to say I have a diverse group of friends would yeah. be an understatement. <laughs> I know, but this is why I like chatting to you. And I some, that, this some is girl I from on. Newcastle. Yeah, this is the thing, and this is where I hang on every like story that you do. Honestly, I'm telling you, good mm. value to follow. Um, <laughs> red light therapy. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm big into it, and uh, I've spoke about this on this pod loads of times, about light, red light therapy. But that, again, is... If I'm right in thinking red light therapy like helps the mitochondria in your cell. Yeah. So will that stop us losing NAD as well, potentially? Yeah. So this is like one of the things that people are like, okay, uh, you know, how can lying under a red light yeah. really benefit me? But actually the science is really strong. So when you talk about red light, you've got visible red light, mm -hmm. which you can actually see, but then you've got infrared light which you can't see but it does it is still there it's on on a, a different part of the spectrum and these wavelengths of light do different things in our body but in particular they activate the mitochondria so literally our mitochondria the energy powerhouses of our cells will absorb these different wavelengths of light and it activates multiple different pathways so it switches on antioxidant production it switches on energy production and sometimes it also activates pathways that get rid of 
damaged mitochondria, so like old power stations, and um, bring in new ones. So you get fresh new mitochondria. And when you look at the different wavelengths, the visible one, acts more like at the skin. So, you know, when you see people with the masks on and it's like, you know, it's for, for cosmetic reasons. I was going to talk reasons. to you about that because <laughs> honestly, there's a lot of people jumping on red light, which is great science. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're buying, again, your home bargains version yes. of this red light mask, people just walking around the house looking like idiots, really. I'm thinking that is not the same thing. It's yeah. What's the wavelength? What's the power exactly. of that light? You know, you need to look at the wavelengths. Um, you need to look at what, you, you know, what are you trying to do? It's not in a commercial setting. So therefore no. I'm thinking, is it strong enough? Exactly. You know? and it's, it's about, it's not always about the strength, it's about the wavelength. Yeah. Um, so if you are, you know, if you're looking for some topical skin benefits, red light, will work. It will have a benefit because it, it probably penetrates, I think it's about two millimeters. So, you know, you're just right on the surface of the skin. But if you actually want a much, I'd say a better benefit, you would want a combination of the red and the infrared because the, the infrared actually penetrates deeper. So it actually is, it, that is a light that is really going to be hitting the cellular level. It's going to be activating the mitochondria. It's going to be reducing inflammation and things like that. So yeah, it's again, it's great that we're seeing more people doing it, but as anything with science, as soon as something becomes popular, you're going to start getting the knockoff versions of things. You're going to start people just jumping on the bandwagon and being like, oh yeah, just, you know, stick this torch on your face and mm. it'll, you know, <laughs> it'll work. <laughs> and it's not the case. So it's always worth doing your research. Yeah. I want to build in my back garden an infrared sauna but that's also got red light panels in it too. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it doesn't exist. I'm going to build myself one. And um, and so I could just sit there for half an hour. And if I could have it hot too, then I'm getting my heat shot proteins from a sauna. Sauna is amazing. Yeah, your infrared, yeah. you know, down at a sailor level. Then you're getting that red light on top. But if I had half an hour a day... Yeah. Oh, put a desk in there, do some work. It'd be amazing. Do it. Honestly, <laughs> do you know what? Can sauna. Come around and have a match in our sauna. Yeah. <laughs> I'll come. Um, no, sauna is like one of those things where I can't remember the exact stat off the top of my head, but it reduced all cause mortality. So literally death by any means by something. Cra I can't remember the percentage, but it was so it was crazy. Like, it was like 70%. I think yeah. Peter would hear, put it down to, I'm sure I heard that on Something that like that. It's like there is no drug in the world yeah. or anything that will will reduce all cause mortality by that exactly and all you've got to do is sit <laughs> well this is the thing and, and this is why i say to people there are so many different things you can do that do not cost money mm -hmm. do not get bought into yeah there's loads of marketing there are some mm -hmm. genuinely great products out there but if you haven't got those funds you can 100 percent address your diet yeah 100 percent do some weight training and 100 percent go and find a sauna somewhere yeah. and go and sit in it Another thing, which is also completely free, which I think is really underestimated, is the value of mindset mm -hmm. and social connection. Yeah. So if you have a mindset that is negative, pessimistic, then you will live less, a, a less healthy life. If you are optimistic, you live longer. Your biological age mm. is lower. The studies on it now. Not only that, but... There's something called like the stereotype embodiment theory, which is if you think you are going to age bad, that is how it will play out in reality. But if you if you actually think, no, I am going to have a positive mindset towards aging. I am not going to think, oh, you know, I've retired or whatever. So it's all downhill. I am going to have a positive mindset that I am going to remain healthy. I am going to live the life I want to lead. There is a lot to be said for the power of thoughts because the power of thoughts influence cellular health. And again, I'm sitting here saying something that's completely out there and the majority of people are going to be going, what is she talking about? Your brain can influence how your cells act. But it, that is, I think, the next big thing, you know, that we're going to start, people are going to start talking about and the scientific evidence is going to start um, appearing to show that actually the power of positive mindset and our thoughts and meditation and things like that actually have a massive influence on the health of our cells. I couldn't agree more. But and the, what we're seeing now is the decay of community. Yeah, we are as used to. You know, used. I remember growing up. You know, what I mean, I had loads of friends. I'd play out all day, and then I had loads of like, oh, Auntie Jean, Auntie Carol. Yeah, they're not your real auntie, but it's just some yeah, your, no, mate, your no, mum's yeah. mate that would look after you. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then you yeah. have this like, yeah, it takes the village to raise a child yeah. kind of community. It's just become so isolated now. Kids do not go out the house. They I do like, and it's because they. 
It's and sad. then they've got hyper socialization on their phones mm-hmm. with all this dopamine and then they're watching porn and then they're watching this and then they're watching that and they just and it's absolutely crazy and it's such a negative way of behaving but then you've got people in the smartest man in the world who wants to um colonize another planet he doesn't want to fit he doesn't want to use his resources and his intelligence to fix what's the problem here he wants to go and colonize another planet so that's where he's got and then you've got megalomaniacs like zuckerberg who's a fucking fuckwit anyway and Mm -hmm. his (laughs) idea of social connection is putting everyone in a fucking metaverse Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, you know what i mean and let's just be half robotic to stop and i just completely agree with you that is not the way and I, i can't stop it yeah well, if you look at blue zones, again, blue mm. zones, something that I've studied for years, but again, it's become a buzzword since the Netflix documentary. Mm. Blue zones are areas of the world where people live till um, great age, but in good health. And a really common trait of these blue zones are that people have a, a sense of purpose. So they, you know, even older people are highly respected in the community, have a job, have a role and have a sense of purpose. But also there's that sense of community and, and togetherness and, you know, knowing that place of where you fit within a grander yeah, scheme of something. Exactly. And grandfathers, grandmothers yeah, are looking yeah, after yeah. the kids. And yeah, Okinawa is a classic example of that in um, Japan. Yeah, I saw it firsthand when I went to China. Yeah. I went to a park on a Sunday morning and they are all weight training in the park. Mm. They're all doing strength training. They're all doing Tai Chi. Tai Chi, yeah. You name it. I was stunned. Yeah. And this is the other thing I said. I was like, this is such a forward thinking country. There was tech everywhere. There was a robot mm. that took my check-in details <laughs> at my hotel, right? But yeah, they still have toilets. There are holes in the floor. Mm-hmm. And I said, they're not doing that because they're not advanced. They're doing that because they know that squatting is great for your hips yeah. and great for your fucking health. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, Danny, let's rip out the toilet. <laughs> 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 yeah so i've had an idea for our bathroom yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no i know yeah it's absolutely crazy so what's next for you nicola mm. what are you up to now uh so so for me uh, a huge amount of my time is is spent trying to educate i just think it's so important now that more people are listening more people understand the, the potential benefit of this I just love trying to get people to learn a little bit of science. Mm. You know, science is always thought of this scary thing that, oh, you know, I'm not into science and it's all graphs and that. But when people can learn a little bit of something about how their body's working and it can, you know, fill a void in their knowledge, it can be very empowering. Um, For example, look at the menopause. A lot of people are talking a lot more about the menopause but still don't really understand why we are getting the symptoms that we have. Mm. For, you know, a big feedback that I got from a lot of women was like, well, I don't understand why my fertility hormones are causing me to go into the supermarket and forgot forget completely why I've gone yeah. in or forget my friend's name that I've known for 20 years. It's like, it doesn't make sense. So... I'm on a bit of a mission to try and like bridge the gaps of like, why is this happening? So the science behind the symptoms, you know, explain to people, well, actually the reason, you know, why is because your estrogen, your fertility hormone is not just for fertility. It's for cellular health. Absolutely, yeah. It powers your mitochondria. Mm. All of a sudden you've got no estrogen, your mitochondria suddenly can't produce energy as well. Also, adding NAD, your NAD levels are declining at the same time, also impacting your mitochondrial function. And your brain needs a lot of energy. Yeah. So actually, the reason why you go into the supermarket is because your mitochondria are just not working anymore. And, and now you're on Ozempic, so you're not eating anything. So you're now you're not even fueling yourself <laughs> and you're not eating any fat or anything like that. So now your brain is just in total decline. Yeah. I'm, honestly, I feel like, obviously, everyone's taking it. It's a really mm. hot topic of drug and stuff but my feelings are everybody wants to be rail thin I get it but for me and I was saying this to my PT yesterday at my age at 40 I would not risk the muscle loss no and like and you do not want to lose muscle now and I'm seeing people again this is why it's so Mm. important to look after your muscle yeah and most of the weight loss is coming from muscle mass yeah not just fat cells increases your metabolism more muscle more metabolism um yeah again we're a society that's focused on the magic pill the magic injection Mm -hmm. what what can i do that's a a shortcut um but yeah i think and again this is because most people have a lack of education so a big focus for me is just just helping people to understand you know why things are happening in the body getting people to understand that our bodies are amazing and everything we need to 
be healthy and strong and fit and you know a good health span yeah is is already in there um, you, would you as part of a health span mix mm. and this is a big raging debate and i have loads of people on this podcast discussing this so obviously hrt is a big mm. big issue yeah. and um it, i believe in a woman's right to choose if you want to have it have it if you don't whatever yeah but in every other industry like or any other condition let's say you've got uh, low thyroid yeah. you would just replace it yeah. with that thyroxin or whatever or if you had a guy and you had low testosterone you replace it with mm -hmm. testosterone but when we get to women's health and we yeah. start declining in estrogen progesterone and testosterone why don't they just g give it to them yeah well or why is it so controversial it's so controversial because of a big study that mm. came out many many years ago that showed a link between taking hrt and cancer which then actually turned out to be completely incorrect and discredited and discredited and but unfortunately it did so much damage that women still think oh i can't take hrt because it increases my risk of cancer actually your decline in hormones increase your risk of everything mm. yeah like if you look at a, a, a woman's risk of multiple age-related diseases your risk shoots up after the menopause and look at biological age so there was a there was a study done so it looked at the biological age of women um, and how it changed going from um you know, completely premenopausal to perimenopausal to menopausal. And over a six month period, it was shown that the average increase in a woman's biological age was nine years. Mm -hmm. So literally these women aged by nine years in six months. So not only does this go a long way to explaining why women say when they hit the menopause, they feel like they've aged 10 years mm -hmm. because literally inside yeah. they have, but that increase in biological age is the biggest risk factor or the best predictor of your future health. Now that was the average. In the study, some women's age increased by 20 years in wow. six months. So what we know is that the only thing that completely reversed this was HRT, mm. completely reversed it. Because, you know, again, I, I completely believe some some women don't want to take it, that's fine. But from a, for, as a scientist, from a scientific point of view, looking at what the scientific data shows, it shows that essentially menopause is a hormone deficiency. Mm. And the best way to fix it is to fix the root cause and that's replace the hormones. And all of the evidence that's building up shows that it has so many benefits to a woman's health. It's it's kind of indisputable um, now. Yeah, I think, again, it's not a magic bullet. If you've got no. the worst lifestyle on the planet yeah. or you've got a really bad lifestyle and you're not going weight training, no HRT on the planet is going to fix it. No. But if you, and you, oh, unfortunately, when you hit to menopause, you do have to start taking your lifestyle really seriously, reduce the alcohol, reduce the caffeine. Mm -hmm. You now have, you know, you, it, it is difficult. So, and, and if you're not going to say KHRT, it's going to be even more difficult where you've got to be really hot on your protocols. Yeah. And NAD is something that for people that don't want to take, it's something that can benefit because yeah. if you look at, at a woman right at a time when they're, you know, their estrogen and um, progesterone and all their other fertility hormones are declining, also their NAD is really, really low as well. So quite often the symptoms of the, are, are quite similar between what, you know, symptoms of low NAD are things like reduction in energy, brain fog tiredness and a lot of those symptoms are also associated with the loss of estrogen and progesterone so for some women even just boosting nad levels can help to alleviate some of the symptoms and make you hang on like, to it a little bit longer yeah and make you hang on to it especially things like brain fog um is, is a big one that um nad can can help with so yeah putting them together works really well even just using one of them um does have an impact well, fabulous. Right, we've come to the end of the pod. I could literally sit here and talk for another two hours. I've got so many more questions that I might get you back one day. Um, when I've when I've got my red light therapy sauna in for red. Like, <laughs> yeah, we'll do it in the Super sauna. center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, that's what I want for Christmas. Um, but yeah, honestly, I've really enjoyed talking to you. If people want to get hold of you, and I'd like I've said, you definitely mm -hmm. should watch your stories. Um, where can they get hold of you? So mostly on Instagram, just at Dr. Nicola Conlon. Um, yeah watch me go to my crazy biohacking yeah, island honestly and... it, it's incredible I'm always like can you do a little video diary for me I want to feel like I'm there <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah it's so interesting yeah. honestly it's great and um, check out our supplement Nuchido yeah just yeah. at Nuchido yeah fabulous well thank you so much for coming in Nicola really appreciate it and lovely to talk to you 
Thank you so Thank much. You.